Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Miguel Montal- Montalva Barba about his book titled White Supremacy and Racism in Progressive America, Race, Place, and Space, published by Bristol University Press earlier in 2024, which, well, as the subtitle says, explores the connections, the entanglements between race, place, and space to help us understand how they contribute to and maintain racial hierarchies um, focused in a particular place that I think is I mean, obviously, there's always utility in investigating a particular place. But I think as our discussion is going to show, what Miguel has found here is not just about this one particular place. There's a lot of lessons um, and ideas that could be taken much, much further than that. So lots to get into here in this book. Miguel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Miranda, for having me. And it's a pleasure to talk to you. Could you start us off, please, by introducing yourself a little bit and explain why you decided to write this book? Yes. So my name is... Um, like you just said, Miguel Montalva Barba, I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and I teach courses around race and racism, urban sociology, things of this sort. This book came out of a couple of different experiences. Um, one, I was initially intrigued. Um, I grew up in California, in Orange County, near LA, and Boston and this particular neighborhood, Jamaica Plain, was the first place that I lived outside of California. And so it was just my first time being outside of a completely different neighborhood, context, people, just about everything was different. Um, And so this intrigued my curiosity into how to make community, how to build connections, all of that stuff. So I think just being in a new place. And so I came to Boston to complete and start my PhD. Um, And so I ended up living in this particular neighborhood. And that as I was going through my PhD program, different faculty sort of kept hinting or pushing pushing me to do kind of to self-study and to focus on a particular research project or a particular dissertation topic that would be about me. And I was at the time and still to this day very critical of this idea of having marginalized scholars sort of study themselves. And that's sort of the way that you move up, move up through the academy. While there's nothing wrong with doing it, I think there's something interesting about institutions pushing students of minoritized um, experience to, to sort of self-study. And so I was kind of really like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like, let me study, let me study up, let me study across, let me study you um and so part of this book really came out of this sort of take this very agentic step in not replicating patterns that i was seeing in particular as it as it pertains to urban sociology and so much of ethnography is sort of built around the individual sort of experience and to contextualize why people were pushing me to to sort of study myself or people like me is I had grown up in the U.S. undocumented. I've been undocumented in the U.S. for 30 years. I'm queer. And so I have a very particular experience and um, what do I want to say? Kind of a a very particular experience to draw from. And so I can see where people can see something um, that was important to study. And to this day, I mean, I will look into that at some point. But in this particular moment, at that particular time, that's not where my brain was. Um, and so there's these are sort of two kind of very personal and a more kind of intellectual level. Um, it was really interesting to start this project and think about kind of a bunch of different fields coming together. And so part of what I was doing and coming up with was I was starting to become really kind of critical about the history of urban sociology. And so there was this, I remember this kind of conversation around kind of atheoretical ethnographies and atheoretical, um, I think at the time they were calling them like jungle book tropes. And so I wanted to to do something that was qualitative, deeply ethnographic, but that actually centered theory. And so part of this work really, I challenged myself to sort of do this in a kind of in a very different way. Um, And I hope that the readers will be able to see that, that I am trying to push and do something a little bit different as opposed to just narrating and kind of 
um, what people told me or what I found in the archives. I think there's um, there's a little bit more depth into what I was trying to get at by centering theory throughout, not just in the beginning or ending of chapters. Um, and so hopefully that comes across. Um, but I think those were sort of the big three. It was, But I do remember very clearly the drive was, let me change something about this. Like, let me do, at least for this dissertation or this big first full project, something that's going to be different, that's going to feel more authentic to what I want to do. And that almost was an agentic step um, to, to sort of what I was feeling at the time. Hmm. No, thank you for telling us about the those foundational kind of motivations for the book. I think in different ways, they all kind of come out in the finished product, which is, I think, true of so many books. You know, we never write a book for one reason. And there's always such a mixture that comes through. And it's, in fact, on that theory point that I'd love to move to next, um, because I at least remember my first introduction to theory always being, oh, there's a new term. Okay, that, that tells us that theory is getting involved here. Um, now, obviously, my understanding of theory, I hope, has expanded since then. But um, that kind of initial recognition definitely is still relevant in reading academic texts. And yours is no exception. There is theory. So you have a key term in this book. Can you tell us what you mean by the term? I mean, tell us what it is. Um, what do you mean by it? And how does this framework give us that ability to weave theory throughout the book rather than, as you said, kind of only at the beginning or only at the end. Yeah, thank you. And um, so I want to go about answering this question, maybe just a little bit slightly different. So when you first pick up the book, you don't even have to pick it up. As you see the cover of the book, you'll you'll come across this kind of dangling sticker, um, which is really interesting. I came across the sticker as I opened the door to my car and I was in this neighborhood that Jamaica Plain that is the center of this work and I open the door and I look up and there's a sticker and I was like that is literally and it says gentrification is genocide um, and I was like this one this is the cover of the book but two look at this sort of really front in my face sort of showing me um, right if you're open to seeing things theory is everywhere Um and this is such a clear indication. And so the book opens sort of the cover of the book and even the first figure of the book is this dangling sticker that reads gentrification is genocide, um, which to some, I think that expression might sound very heavy, very loaded. I mean, given the political context that we find ourselves in, um, even the arguments around the use of the term gen uh, genocide is also kind of pretty loaded at this moment. Um but this is something that housing advocates have been saying for a very long time, that gentrification is a form of genocide. Um, and so part of what I was, uh, what I'm getting at here with this particular term that I coined that's called gen sociocide is sort of to address this sort of, um, I guess, complexity or this, this need to have something that can give us to name this particular violent process that happens in the process of gentrification. Uh, and so part of what this term aims to encapsulate is what I call sort of like the generational killing of the social, which is sort of what housing advocates are aiming to say when they say gentrification is genocide, where people are displaced from particular places and spaces, the places that they have known all their lives or where they raised their families or things of the sort. And as soon as people are displaced from that, from that initial sort of point, um, there's this particular violence that's enacted where you're perpetually aimed to feel like you're going to constantly be moved. I go about this in the book in a couple of different ways, but in particular, this story about um, this family. Uh, so the mother is narrating, her name is FC, and she, she talks about being displaced from the initial kind of urban renewal program in Boston. And so she ended up being in kind of the south end of Boston and now moving into this other community, Jamaica Plain, and now feeling like displaced and and is now going to also be displaced from Jamaica Plain. And so she's now, it's a perpetual pattern that she's now experiencing. And so there's this particular kind of mourning that her narrative highlights where she, she can't even go back to the streets, to the, to see the neighborhood, to see the community because it's completely demolished. 
no, the street that she grew up doesn't exist anymore. It is now a Whole Foods, right? And so it's this kind of very typical narrative of gentrification. But when we think about the actual experience, it addresses this particular violence um, and this particular kind of mourning that people that have been pushed out of the places that they have known as home. Um, and so this term gentrification aims to capture this particular experience and this to, to sort of give it a name. Um, part of what I also do in, in sort of the initial part of this book is to to challenge um, right our typical gen definitions of gentrification. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Our typical definitions of genocide don't include cultural ways, and and this is sort of the the, the connection that housing advocates are trying to make. And so by sort of maybe thinking of creating some, a new concept that can encapsulate that cultural component or that social component, I'm hoping that this gives us kind of the term or the vehicle to be able to name this particular experience. Hmm. No, being able to name things gives us a lot of agency, as you were talking about earlier, to then have a look at them and investigate them and maybe do something about them. Um, so thank you for walking us through kind of the key term here to set us up for the rest of our discussion, as long as we also do one other bit of, I think, key foundational work, um, which is, of course, the place that you are investigating. For those of us who have not been to Jamaica Plain, can you give us a brief introduction to it? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so I've been living in Jamaica Plain for 12 years now. Jamaica Plain is a borough of Boston, Massachusetts, which is about 20 minutes from downtown Boston. So it's very close to the downtown. It's part of the kind of Boston metro area. Um, it has always sort of been a very historically important place to the development of Boston, to the development of New England, and in general, kind of the U.S. Um, it has been important to the development of of the U.S. really from colonial times. A lot of kind of dignitary city officials lived in Jamaica Plain or would have a house in Jamaica Plain um, because it's seen as this beautiful, lush, green place that has an, a natural pond that has, um, it used to have, it used to house like the main artery that would allow folks to go from kind of Boston to Providence and down to New York City. And so it was just, it's, it's a very kind of important place. Um, another thing that characterizes Jamaica Plain is, right, it's this investment in green spaces. Um, so that means, uh, historically, Frederick Olmsted, who also designed Central Park, designed a network of parks here in Boston, and it's called the Emerald Necklace. And JP is sort of right in the middle of that. And so it's really kind of surrounded by green space all around Another thing that makes JP a little unique is kind of it has this urban suburban feel to it where you're because it's so green and it's so lush, you almost feel like you're in kind of a suburb, but it's very much connected to the urban core. Um, right now, uh, JP is one of the most progressive neighborhoods in the country. It's like, I think, in the top 15. Um and so the politics here in this particular neighborhood are far from left. Um, the representative, Zayana Presley, one of the kind of most progressive representatives that the U.S. has at the moment. Um, part of this progressive left narrative and character of this neighborhood is something that folks have been nurturing for a very long time. A lot of folks moved to Jamaica Plain or as the sort of residents call the JP around the 60s and 70s where... A lot of progressive people were sort of young professionals, young white professionals were moving into cities. They were really active in the politics, whether it was artist or anti-war movement or queer activism, um, really just kind of all kinds of all kinds of different political uh, inclinations, but mostly in kind of very progressive causes. Um What's also interesting, this neighborhood also has the narrative of being very a queer neighborhood, in particular, a kind of lesbian enclave, which you can see sort of how much politics is embedded in this very kind of important neighborhood to Boston. Um, it also is seen as diverse, as you can tell, both by political, but also by different groups. Um, and so there's an African-American community that has been here 
for a long time, as well as Dominican folks and Puerto Ricans as well. Um, and so you start to see this kind of very progressive community take shape. And this is really kind of the the narrative that exists around Boston and New England about this particular neighborhood. Um, I can You can sort of align it to maybe kind of a Berkeley, uh, California, uh, for those that might have visited over on that side. Um, and so there's this particular narrative of activism that's super important here um, that really drives the politics. And in some ways, you can start to sort of see the picture of uh, kind of a traditional gentrification story where you see the activist and the queer folks and all of this stuff come together in this particular place that has such important um, such an important place to um, to Boston. And then one last thing is this neighborhood has been gentrifying for quite a long time. Um, in really just the last couple of decades, like the housing prices um, have doubled. They're people that when I interviewed them and they, they moved here, they bought a home in the 80s for like twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 are now selling their homes for like $1.7 million. Right? And so there's this kind of complete flip of this neighborhood that used to be kind of a little scrappy. Now it's very high end. And so it's, it's a neighborhood that has all of these different criteria that's really beautiful, but it's also because of all of that narrative and that history, it is changing and is gentrifying rapidly. Yeah, this is very helpful to understand um, the history and the current state and kind of how those things have changed um, to help us then investigate sort of what's there and amidst all of this change, you know, going back to the subtitle of the book, race, place and space, um, those things are not staying static um, and are all very much kind of interlinked. We can't just say, well, that was history. That's no longer relevant here. Um, that's very much what your book shows we should not be doing. So exactly on that point, um, can we talk about settler colonialism? How is it physically visible in the place you've just described and visible also in the way people talk as well? Yes, yes, yes. And so this is so important. I think this is like kind of one of the main points that I that I try to be very specific about in the book is one to think about settler colonialism as something physical that is visible that we can as long as we sort of attune our our eyes to to being able to see it that we might be able to to recognize it when we see it. Um, and so settler colonialism is so visible in JP. Um, it was surprising to find it at times, but I think once you attune your eyes, you're like, oh, wait, it's everywhere. Um, so the most apparent, of course, is the name. I initially, when I first moved here, I thought it was like, oh, you know what? There must be like some actual connection to the country of Jamaica. I don't know. There must be something here. And yes, there is in some way, but it's not in the the way that I thought the connection would be. Um, the name itself um, developed. There's like four origin stories about the naming of, of JP. One is the two sort of center indigenous folks. One is this um, indigenous woman whose name was Jamako. And and people would allegedly sort of exclaim, I'm going to visit Jamako and pass by the plain. And so plain being sort of the, the topography of the area and then Jamako into Jamaica plain. Um, that sort of one story. The other story is of a chief in Sashem known Kuchamenken. Um, and he too was sort of very revered um, to colonial folks because he sort of partnered with them, but um, he never really fully converted or sort of accepted their religious practices. And so they had some kind of admiration. And so when you know, shorten his name, Chamenken, um, people m make the claim that Jamaica developed out of that. Um, and then the other two stories are interesting because they bring us to a conversation about quite literally colonialism and settler colonialism, but in particular, kind of the triangle trade, um, sugar, Indian rum. It brings us to these kind of very particular moments. And so part of one of the stories is that folks from JP, so these are wealthy um Colonels that would um, essentially one enjoy drinking Indian rum 
And so Indian rum is made from molasses, which brings us to sort of the, the triangle trade and um, kind of this is historic um, and violent history. And then the other story is this fantasies about what Cardinals imagine Jamaica to be. And so they imposed this character of Jamaica onto the topography of JP. And so it was sort of transferring what they imagined Jamaica to be to projecting that onto what they saw in front of them. So they dreamed that Jamaica would be this lush tropical paradise. And so they pushed those ideas onto Jamaica Plain. And so the names themselves, the name itself of Jamaica Plain is embedded in so much history um, and so much kind of really heavy, violent processes. Um, And so, of course, this isn't just end here. When you start to look a little further, a lot of the street signs feature fruits and citrus and bananas and pineapples. And then you're like, wait a minute. So what is the connection now to fruits, citrus, and bananas, and pineapples, and avocados? Um, and again, it goes back to some of this kind of colonial, settler colonial history of, one, the United Fruit Company, some of the members that developed that sort of had connections to Jamaica Plain as well. Um, we think about pineapples, the Doe family, right? So this is like the giant pineapple empire Um the person, uh, the Dole family lived in JP and their house is still preserved um, here. And so it's in the in the naming, it's in the street signs, what is worth preserving, right? What must be saved? What must we preserve? What must be called? What must be, uh, essentially what really must be saved gives us an importance as to what kind of narratives particular places are are creating or are aiming to create for themselves. And these narratives are important because they give us a sense of what is important to a particular culture, a dominant culture. And so these narratives are always important to think about as we're sort of looking into these, into particular places. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think, Oh, sorry, please go ahead. I was just, I I was just pleased that you discussed kind of the name of it because obviously as someone not familiar with Jamaica Plain, like that was one of my very first questions. Like, wait, why is it called Jamaica Plain? It's in Boston. Um, So hearing this examination, and obviously in the book, there's even more detail about how this all came together, I think helps start to make these theoretical points you're making come clear right from the beginning. Um, But please do tell us about the linguistic aspect, because I did ask about that as well. (laughs) No, thank you. I mean, I think it's in some ways, like once you start to dig a little bit deeper, like you say about the name, like I too had those same questions initially, like, wait a minute, what is happening with this name? Um, but once you start to look into some of this history, it's, it's, it really does kind of highlight itself. Um, I was going to say linguistically, some of these features are, are visible in the way that people express themselves about their connection or their origin story. So part of the project was to do a lot of ethnographic work. So a bunch of hours of visiting, you know, doing all of that kind of qualitative work. But also I interviewed folks of various tenures in JP. And so to me, that was super important. One, to include folks that had been in Jamaica Plain for 30, 40 years, you know, and varieties within that. And then folks that have been born and raised. In, in Jamaica Plain. And so it was part of the the intent was to see there has to be differences in the way people think and talk about their own experience. Um, and so the way settler colonialism became visible as through people's ex, uh, kind of narrations of their lived experiences or their housing histories was really relating back to kind of foundational settler colonial um kind of principle. So a lot of what makes settler colonialism very different from colonialism is the focus on the family and the focus on exclusive communities, the 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 focus on the child, and particularly the white child here in the US, to to be the person that we invest all of our energy because that's sort of the the white future in the making. And so the way people talked about what made them sort of change their how did they decided to choose a particular school um even if they didn't have children when people start to think about even the idea of a child 
all of those ideas became directly connected to private property to one respondent said his the way he was calculating moving in or this particular investment of moving into Jamaica Plain was cost of value family. And that really sort of encapsulates this very particular utility of the white family and the white child as something that's vulnerable and valuable, but it's also something that has this kind of um, financial embeddedness to the category and the ideal itself. And so it showed up a lot in these conversations around children and family. Um, the other way in which it showed up was in the way people talked about community and diversity, um, the way people were able to make sense of kind of self-segregation. And in a lot of this sort of related back to this particular um, cost value family narrative that I sort of develop, um, sort of develop in like the second or third chapter. Yeah, this kind of, in t- I think this is one of the parts I was particularly thinking of when I introduced the book at the beginning as being so many ideas entangled, right? Um, this is such an interesting and illustrative example of that. So thank you for explaining the linguistic piece of this. To what extent then does it make any difference for individual or even groups of white people in Jamaica Plain? What difference does it make for them to be working against these narratives of settler colonialism? It, it, do we see disruption of this reproduction of the dominant narrative? There are cases, and we do see it, and I think this is part of one of the the interesting pieces that I found that kind of really pushed me to focus on this particular topic and and work, was that initially most of the people that I interviewed sort of, so these were like the folks that arrived around the 60s, 60s and 70s and so forth, um, most of them lived in kind of group homes or in communes where they really were challenging sort of a white supremacist capitalist patriarchal expectation, literally co-raising children, sharing financial resources with each other, really quite living a very alternative lifestyle. And there's still aspects of that here in Jamaica Plain. Um, But because so much of the financial aspects where there's the housing price and all that stuff, that kind of stuff is changing a lot and it has changed a lot. But there were there there were folks that were actively working to to sort of ch- uh, challenge those narratives, whether they were being I think they were being very deliberate at the time, um, but it was really this transfer or this arrival of of children that really caused the change that really caused people to quite literally say, we might need to think about where we live because we need good schools. We might need to really think about where those good schools are. Right, and so it's this particular moment of of the idea of the child that really made folks change what they had already sort of sort of figured out and developed. But it was this particular kind of advancement, or this planning for kind of like this exclusive white future that their potential child should have, um, and that itself goes back to a lot of these particular narratives that, at least in the U.S., are very deep, where it's very kind of individually. So much of the U.S. is centered around this individual self-earner, self-push, where to actively work on community to creating these particular different lifestyles was really radical at the time, and it still is radical. And so I think there is important work to be done there. Um, I think (laughs) a couple years down the line, I've had this sort of nugget in my brain to do a particular study on the commune the communes here in Jamaica Plain and lessons to be learned from from this experience because there are still some functioning. Um, but I do think, so there's there's these moments of where you can disrupt this, but I think part of that is coming, coming to terms with what sort of Audre Lorde calls like the mythical norm or Bell Hooks calls um, white supremacist capitalist patriarchal system that we're all sort of fighting and dealing with. Um, and I think this is sort of where you see sort of the, the, the tension here, where books were, are really invested in kind of changing community, but there is a, there's sort of a moment of pause or a limit as to the reach that they're able to do. Um, another example of this is sort of to see like folks here in this community who love to advocate for housing, um, affordable housing um, in that kind of kind of project. 
but when it came to building something here in JP or to make a plane, folks didn't want that now because all of a sudden their property values were in sort of limbo as you know they assume which so far nothing has happened actually it's gotten worse <laughs> the property prices have increased but this particular fight and so i think there's there's something interesting about property values and and how much of that is really connected to an american ideological core that actively working around disrupting this really has to be a deliberate choice and um, community was such a key part of what you just talked about there um what about ideas of diversity? How are those being discussed? And to what extent are they also maintaining white exclusivity over specific places? Yeah, so these are like the two biggest themes in the book is diversity and community. Everybody wanted to talk talk about community. Everybody wanted to talk about diversity. Everybody said they love diversity. Um, and one of the kind of born and raised um, respondents was very kind of like kind of a tongue in cheek about it she was like people at jp love diversity but they don't engage with it and that's sort of the um the interesting tone right just because you know where black folks or where latinx people live or queer folks live does it mean you're actively engaging in diversity that means you know where those people live and their position throughout the city but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're um, engaging with it um it's interesting, the idea of community, because so much, one of the things you'll hear if, if if people visit is that JP is a community place. People spend a lot of time creating community or investing in um, really just preserving some of its kind of radical um, inclinations. But what ended up happening is through the different cohorts of folks that I interviewed, it was those kind of 30 to 40 year old tenure folks that didn't think the new residents had the same sense of community. And that created kind of this tension between the newcomers and the old sort of the old guard. Um, they felt that newer residents did not invest in community. They were just here because of the narrative that the neighborhood had achieved, that he was, you know, progressive beautiful uh, Victorian homes, all of that. And so there began to develop this, this kind of split between kind of older folks or new older residents and newer residents. Um, and so this, this tension really is, is really kind of central to this moment. I think in some ways, a lot of folks that move to JP that I've heard now don't necessarily say they would have remained in this particular, or they would have moved here if they knew what it would become. And so it's a particular, or it's such an interesting thing to think about um, what something becomes sort of the future of a place is not necessarily what you thought it would be um, initially when you first moved Then I guess that makes makes perfect sense, but it, there's, some, there's something there that's kind of interesting to sort of disentangle. As far as diversity, um, it was interesting to think about diversity in kind of both very practical, right? Um, Part of what happened in JP is around the 50, around the fifties, um, kind of deindustrialization. All those kind of things were taking place, and so a lot of, um, and also the white folks were being subsidized by the federal, the U.S. federal government to move out to the suburbs. And so a lot of folks, a lot of white folks, moved out of JP, and black and brown folks came to sort of stabilize or at least serve as. Uh, placeholders for the time being and so what is happening now is white folks are coming back to jp and so the numbers are rising up again um, and this has been taking shape in the last like decade or so um but one of the things that happens with this naval of diversity is that one folks don't really quite engage with it two diversity is seen as something that you can opt in or buy into um, and so this happened in a couple of different ways where like some parents chose to stay in JP as opposed to moving out to the suburbs because they wanted to provide for their children diversity because one, they wanted that diversity for themselves, but they wanted to provide that diversity for their children. And some even said that they would give them an advantage um, kind of in society moving forward, right? So society becomes this particular 
good that you can provide your child. Um, a lot of other folks talked about diversity and like, I don't mind diversity as long as folks have the same values living next to me, um, which that in itself is already now <laughs> fully messing well with the idea of diversity. And so part of what happened is the sort of initial sort of economic and racial diversity that started in the 60s and 70s really transferred. And now diversity is seen and the way people talk about it is we're diverse place. We have a taco place. We have Thai place. We have a Spanish tapas place. We have a Mexican restaurant, right? We have all these kind of different ethnic foods that are diverse, that are telling us this neighborhood is diverse. And it really changes the way people engage and think about diversity. Yeah. I mean, the idea of I want to live with diverse people as long as they all agree with me and let's eat lots of nice food. Like that's a very particular kind of diversity um, and definitely worth kind of poking at and rather than just sort of taking statements of diversity at face value. It's like, well, what do we actually mean by that? Because it turns out in this case, it means something very specific. As I think I've hinted at um, already, I mean, even just from now knowing the different stories behind the name Jamaica Plain, um, that was certainly quite surprising and interesting to read about. And there were multiple other instances of like, oh, okay, that wouldn't have thought that or didn't realize that. What about in your process? Obviously, you're much closer to all this material. This has been something you've been deeply invested in for ages. Is there anything you came across in the research or writing of this book that especially surprised you? There were so many things. <laughs> I think in a very kind of personal account, one of the things that really like, I initially was kind of hesitant and I didn't, you know, start this project without really thinking about it fully. But one of the things that people said, um, because this book is based on interviewing only white folks, um, some folks said that uh, white folks might not feel comfortable, might not feel, um, you know, as comfortable to share their full opinion as they, they would have if it was a white interviewer. Um, I am from Mexico. Um, I... You know, I, I guess I became Latina when I came to the U.S. And um, and part of part of this part of what ended up happening is I started to have these conversations with folks and I was and I began to question them like, what about me makes people feel comfortable to really quite literally tell me very racist statements or statements that um, I, I don't know, I guess I found kind of troubling Um and so part of that process, I, I was really surprised sort of by this process that was taking place where I was interviewing folks were sharing a lot of kind of important pieces of information. But then I was like, wait, what about me is letting folks know that they're, they can be so comfortable, which is a wonderful thing for a researcher, especially qualitative researcher. But there was a point there that I was like, you know what, there's something here. So part of that is one of those surprises. Um, and so I was really surprised by by how much folks just really wanted to talk about. I remember this particular interview and this person was just so excited to talk about gentrification. And she was like, before I even started recording, she was like, I want to talk about the positive things about gentrification because it is so good. <laughs> and, and it was just like, she's like, I've been waiting to have this conversation with somebody. Um, and so it was, that kind of stuff surprised me of just how much folks want to be listened to. I think the other thing that really surprised me is the power of socialization, which I should not be surprised, but I think it was it was reaffirming, I guess, in, in some capacity, how powerful socialization is and how much our origin stories, how much are the neighborhoods that we grew up in, the kind of families we had, the kind of neighborhoods we were raised in really highlight our own narratives and the way we see and view the world. I um, mean, I think that was one of the things that was really kind of that's really kind of at the center of this book, the power of socialization. But then I was also like, wow, we, this is really key. And I remember so many people talked about how much Jamaica Plain either reminded them of where they grew up or how much it differed from where they grew up. And so, so much of their conception of place was rooted against or for that initial housing history and how important that was to them. Um, and you know, and that 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 is super key in many in many ways. I think, um, 
I think that those are like the two to three big things that really kind of shocked me. Um, and I think I was also kind of shocked by how visible all this stuff was. I think once I really sort of attuned my eyes to how visible settler colonialism can be, it's hard to unsee it. And I mean, it's even harder because I have been living in this particular neighborhood for the 12, you know, 12 some years. And so it's it's hard to disentangle yourself from those place that you're studying. Yeah. I mean, especially given you've lived there, you're not just doing field work and then going back somewhere, right? You're deeply embedded in all of this. Um, thank you for sharing those surprises. I always find it really illuminating to hear about them um, and kind of gives a even more of a picture of what you ended up you know, being able to figure out and write about in the book. So thank you for explaining those two to three kind of big surprises. In this kind of then macro part of our discussion, I suppose, given everything we've discussed so far, what do you most hope readers take away from all of this? I I, I love this question. It's one of these like super hard questions that um, what I think, I think folks really can... I hope what folks take away from this is um, I'm not villainizing children. Like I, I have not, or the category it's right. It's the the power that is invested in these categories and these ideals that is really the key. And so what I try to say by that is that what I hope folks get is that we have to really be critical about the patterns that we're replicating. We have to be critical about how, and what it is that we're doing so that we're not replicating kind of centuries old processes um, and narratives and discourses um, in order to arrive at a new world, something that is better, more equitable, more humane for more people. I think we have to really be careful and really focus on kind of the patterns that we're replicating. Um, I also folks, I would love for folks to take um kind of a new, how do I phrase this? Kind of think about gentrification in a new way, not just something that is kind of just started, but it's something that is ultimately, I make the claim that it, it is connected to settler colonialism. Um, and so these processes of of changing things, of, of displacing folks, right? They didn't just start a decade ago. Um, and so I've, I hope to give folks this very kind of historical understanding of gentrification and in some ways think about research and kind of our, I mean, sociology in general as something that is more expansive as opposed to limiting. I think one of the things that I do in the book is I bring literature from critical race theory, urban geography, feminist uh, geography, kind of really kind of all over the place to, to, to create something different to create something that allows us to have conversations about um, things that are kind of either seen as field specific or um, are left to talk to those other people. And so I, I'm, I'm, I hope folks are able to sort of take away um, kind of a new way of configurating uh, research or, or the research process. Um, yeah, I think those are the big takeaways. And I, you know, I think that the other big takeaway is I hope they enjoy it. I hope they are able to see. I think there's, I I hope they enjoy looking at the photographs, looking at some of the accounts, looking at how visible settler colonialism can be um, to, to really think about the places and spaces that we, and racism um, in the places that we sort of live our lives. Hmm. Lots of good takeaways there. Thank you for highlighting them. I'd like to then, as a final question, um, pick up on that point about research process. What might you be researching now that this book is done? <laughs> so, it, so it's interesting. So I'm researching two, two new big pieces. Then the first one is on work on deported or returned immigrants back in Mexico, Mexico City in particular. And... And so that work is is sort of something that I've been thinking about for a long time, um, and that's slowly taking shape. It is it is I, I think it's connected to this particular work and, and some of the things that I'm already seeing with some of the preliminary pre preliminary findings. Um, and so I'm super intrigued about this particular next phase or this particular phase of this project. 
um, it is deeply personal um, because a lot of my parents or my parents and my family and a lot of my family is still kind of undocumented. And so this idea of being deported or returned to Mexico sort of brings up a lot of kind of feelings, um, unhad conversations, um, things of the sort. And then the other project, which I started maybe a couple months ago, is essentially the extension to to this particular book um, that focuses on the experience of Black and Latinos in Jamaica Plain. Um, and so for this project, I the Russell Sage Foundation, um, I received a, a grant from the Russell Sage Foundation. And so this work has been funded to sort of continue and expand on this particular case. And so this work is sort of taking a different approach to gentrification. So instead of focusing on the displacement of people of color as something that gentrification causes and people of color being sort of reactionary to gentrification, um, I'm taking a f- kind of the flip side of, of that and saying, yes, while some folks are displaced, some folks stay and others can't leave due to you know all kinds of housing issues. And so what is that experience like? What is it like to um, witness the emplacement of whiteness, which is what the title of the project is, witnessing the emplacement of whiteness? Um, what is that process like? What is it like to witness, to see, to, to, to see this change in the neighborhood where a whole new group of people are coming in? You've seen this through different time periods. How are you making sense of this? How does this affect your own positionality? your own sense of self and space and claim to, to those areas. And so this next phase is sort of the the other side of this, of um, of my book. And so it, I'm excited for this project, but it is, it is drawing on kind of slightly different techniques, um, different theoretical frameworks. But um, I think it's important to sort of have a very full picture of what is happening in this, in Jamaica Plain. Well, both of those projects sound very interesting. So thank you for the sneak preview about both of them. Um, And of course, while you're working on them, listeners can read the book we've been talking about titled White Supremacy and Racism in Progressive America, Race, Place and Space, published by Bristol University Press in 2024. Miguel, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Miranda. And thank you so, so, so much for having me.